Hey everybody, what's going on? Eric here with Switch Adapted Toys, and I'm really excited to show you our latest version of our 3D printed switch button. Uh, this is what we're calling our Mega Switch. Uh, it's essentially the same as our normal switch, just much bigger. It's a much bigger target for our kiddos to hit. Uh, it measures at about six and a quarter inches wide, and, and quite honestly, I don't know of any switch that's larger than that. Uh, it still offers the same great light force activation that our normal switch does. Uh, Off-center hits still work great. It's just like I said, it's a much bigger target. So just to show you, I'm gonna just give it a little light press on the side and it still activates. So it's a really great switch option if you are needing a bigger button. If you like this video, if you find it helpful, make sure you hit the like button and hit subscribe. Uh, that way you'll stay up to date on all our latest videos and it really does help us out in a huge way. So thank you in advance for that. If you just stumbled across this video or you don't know about Switch Adapted Toys, uh, Switch Adapted Toys is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and our mission is to make play possible for kiddos of all abilities. Uh, we do that by creating how-to videos, uh, creating files for people to 3D print uh, solutions for buttons, uh, and we're adding new services all the time. So we've got a lot of exciting things kind of um, coming down the pipeline. So uh, subscribe. Uh, you can join our website and stay up to date on everything that we got going on. Uh, without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. We're going to start by going over all the printer settings that you're going to need to print this. So uh, let's go ahead and jump over to the computer and I'll show you uh, what you need to do. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is get our STL files off of our website. So if you go to www.switchtoys.org, and log into your account. Uh, if you don't have an account already, it is completely free, uh, but you will need an account to, to access the files. Uh, and then you can go to Resource Hub and File Library. This is kind of our home base for our 3D printed files, as well as toy manuals that we've got like written manuals for. Uh, if you haven't checked that out, check those out because there are some toys in there that we don't have videos for, but we do have written manuals for. Uh, but we're here for the 3D printed switch button and the mega switch. All right, so here is our zip file and that's what's gonna contain our STL. So I'm gonna go ahead and download that. And when it's done downloading, you can go ahead and open up that zip file. And that will show you our STL files here. So there's three files. There's the base, the ring, and the top. Uh, each one of these will probably need to be printed separately because they're so large, they're gonna pretty much take up your whole build plate. Um, but I'll show you each one of um, the settings that we use for each. Um, so let's just go ahead and load this into our slicing software. So we have a Bamboo Labs printer, so we're going to use Bamboo Studios. Uh, your slicing software might look different compared, uh, just depending on what 3D printer you use. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load in, uh, we'll do the base first. So I'm gonna load in our base, and you can see it shows up here. Now, the settings that we use for the base, uh, we print pretty much all these at 0.16 millimeters for our layer height. Uh, you could play around with this a little bit, uh, but 0.16 millimeters seems to be fine. Uh, our strength for all of these, for our infill density, we keep at 15% and we use grid. Again, that's for all, all three files. Uh, where things will vary a little bit are the supports. So for this one, we don't need to print any supports. Um, so this is pretty much good to go to slice. And I'll show you kind of what this does. So um, you'll see it takes about two hours and 41 minutes for our 3D printer to print this. Uh, yours might take a little bit longer. Our, our 3D printer is pretty quick. Uh, but basically what just happened is the computer kind of created a path that the 3D printer print head will take in order to print this this piece out. So um, I, all I got to do now is hit print and it will send it to my printer and, and a little bit less than three hours later I'll have the base printed out. So uh, the base is pretty easy. Let's go ahead and do a new project here and I'll show you how to uh, do the ring next. So. I'm going to load in my ring and the ring here, this is what connects the base to the top. 
There are these little overhangs here that we do need to generate supports for. So I'm gonna go ahead and enable supports. And for these, I like to use normal supports. Um, we're gonna keep our layer height the same, our infill density the same, our infill pattern the same. Everything is the same, except now we've generated supports to support these little clips here. So I'm gonna go ahead and slice this. And this will take me uh, about 48 minutes. And you can see this green section here, these are the supports. So that's what's actually being built in order to support the, the little clip there on the top. So you can go ahead and print this and in a little less than an hour you'll have your ring printed out and now i'll show you how to do the top so i'm going to load in my top file now this comes in right side up which is how i like to print these um, you could print this uh, upside down the reason why i like to print these right side up is because i get a nice edge here this curved edge just turns out a lot nicer when i print it in this orientation uh, the downside is is that i have to basically fill up the bottom side here with support material to support this this top of the cap um, for me that's not a huge deal uh, what i like to do is i enable supports and i use tree supports uh, if I were to just use normal supports, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, it basically fills that entire cavity up with support material. So this green is all the supports that it's generating. And this can be kind of a pain to remove and it just uses a lot of filament. So instead of using normal supports, what I like to do is use tree supports. Sometimes they're called organic supports. Um, and I, specifically I use hybrid. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. I'll slice this now. We've kept all the other settings the same, 0.16 millimeters for the layer height. The uh, infill density is all the same. Uh, this is gonna take me three hours and 41 minutes to print. Uh, it will create a bunch of support material, but not nearly as much as before. And these are so much easier to get in here and just clean up, uh, just kind of knock them off with, you know, I just kind of use my fingers to kind of get in there and break all these little pieces off. Uh, but they will support the top of uh, the cap. So that's what I like to do. And then I get a, a much nicer edge. I'll show you what you need to do if you're gonna print it the other way. So we'll go back here. I'm gonna just flip this upside down, just like that. So what's nice about this is I don't have to have all this support material in here to generate the, the top because it's upside down. Uh, but I will need to generate a little bit here to support this rounded edge. Uh, so I'm gonna change this to normal. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, you can totally print it this way. It's just, you're not gonna have a nice, clean, rounded edge. It's just gonna be kind of rough and jagged. I'm gonna keep all my other settings the same. Um, if your printer struggles to do little overhangs, you could keep this turned off on build plate, plate only, and that will generate supports to support the little clips here. Um, to support these little overhangs. hard to see there you go uh, to support this here my printer does pretty well with these little overhangs so I'm not gonna worry about that um, so I can just hit on build plate only and that's just gonna generate the support to kind of support this uh, curved area here um, but if your printer struggles to do those just keep this turned off and it will generate supports like this See, it'll fill that up with support. It's got a little bit of support material here. This edge is still gonna be kind of rugged and kind of jagged, but um, it'll save you a lot of filament and a lot of time, quite honestly, uh, to print it out this way. Printing it out this way basically takes one hour and 45 minutes as opposed to, I think it was like three hours and 45 minutes. Um, but I really like that nice clean look, so that's how I like to do it. So once you've got your files and you got them printed, all I have to do once I finish slicing is hit print and it sends it to my printer and then I, and I just wait until it's done and it's ready to go. Um, so we'll go ahead and print all these off and then I'll show you how to assemble them.
All right, so I've got all our pieces here. Uh, my ring just finished printing. I'm just gonna peel that off and there's a little bit of support material that I'll need to remove. Uh, I won't bother you by showing you how to remove all the material from inside here. It's gonna depend a little bit on how you print it. Like I talked about before, we like to print our tops right side up uh, because we get a much nicer edge here, uh, but it does require a lot of uh, support material on the inside. So I've already cleared all that out. It's pretty easy to do, just uh, just do with your fingers, just kind of break all those off. Um, and now what we need to do is put our ring inside of our top. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna line up the tabs with the little slots on the ring. And what's nice is that this ring is kind of big enough and it's flexible enough that um, all we really need to do is just kind of work our way around, kind of pushing it into place and then it will kind of snap down in place. And now our ring is secured on our top. All right, so here's our base. And you can see there's actually four places here for mechanical keyboard switches. Um, you know, generally you buy these as a pack, so it, and they do work really well together. So, I mean, yeah, you could use springs and stuff like that instead of this, um, but honestly, this is a pretty easy solution. It doesn't really cost that much extra for a couple extra buttons since you're buying a pack already. I mean, a, 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 a mechanical keyboard is, is about 30 cents. So we're not talking about a lot of money for a couple extra keyboard switches. Uh, if one of them happens to go bad or something, you've got a couple extra you could switch out really easily. Um, but it just it just provides the right amount of force to keep the button up uh, and still trigger when you uh, press it. So only one of these will need to actually be wired up. And we're gonna wire up the center one and basically the ones on the outside are just there to kind of add a little extra spring and a little support. Uh, so let's go ahead and pop those in and we'll get to wiring our uh, mechanical keyboard switch in the center. All right, so I've got my four uh, mechanical keyboard switches. These are the Cherry MX Speed Silver switches. What's nice about these is that they require very little uh, travel in order to activate. Um, so these are the ones I would definitely get. You could probably do uh, with other mechanical keyboard switches if you have some, but if you really want that light force activation, uh, these are the way to go. So I'm just gonna go ahead and plop in the ones around the outside. And they just click into place. Just like that. Then we need to address our headphone jack wire. Uh, I'm using a mono uh, headphone jack. So there's uh, just a tip and a sleeve. Um, I really recommend that you find a mono headphone jack cable. You can get them pretty cheap on uh, Amazon. Uh, this is a six foot long cable that I'm actually gonna cut in half. That way I get two of them. But if you wanted a longer cable, you could just cut it at six feet. Uh, we only need one of these male ends, so I'm just gonna cut this in half so that I get two. There we go. All right, so now I'm going to fish my wire through the hole in the base. I'm gonna pull a bunch of extra slack out. And now I'm going to strip down the, this headphone jack wire. So I need to remove this outside casing. And you can see inside I've got two wires. Uh, your wires might have different colors. There it might be some bare wires here. Uh, if you have any bare wires, you're gonna want to protect them. So just the tips are exposed. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove about a half of an inch of the tip of the wire, just so I've got about half of an inch exposed. Then I'm going to basically wrap that exposed wire around the prong on the uh, mechanical keyboard switch. So I've kind of got some stubby fingers, so I like to use a little bit of tweezers just to kind of help me get that around. It doesn't need to look pretty. You just wanna make sure that there's enough wires there that are making contact with that prong. And you wanna make sure that you don't have any like stray wires that might cross over and touch the other prong. And then we can solder it. So all I'm gonna do is just use my soldering iron to heat up that prong and those wires. And then I'm gonna bring my solder in and just kind of put a glob of solder on there to make that connection. Now I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. 
All right, so now it's a good time to test your switch and just make sure that it works before we go ahead and, and secure it into the base. There we go. All right, so uh, if you've done one of our 3D printed switches before, this will kind of all be the same. Uh, the center switch will go in the center housing. The wires will come out here and needs to go through this uh, cable capture. That's what's gonna kind of prevent a child from yanking the whole wire out of the switch. Uh, so all I need to do is just put it, this into the housing, just like that. And then I'm gonna push the cable into the cable capture, just like that. And then pull out the extra slack. There we go. Now, what I like to do is I like to add a little bit of CA glue or super glue in this little slot just to make sure that that wire doesn't slip and um, that wire doesn't get pulled out. And then I like to use a little bit of activator and that will basically instantly dry that super glue. Alright, so now we can go ahead and screw on the top. And looks like it's working well. Let's go ahead and plug in a toy and just make sure that it still works. There we go, all done. All right, so that's basically it. If you like this video, if you find it helpful, make sure you hit the like button and hit subscribe to stay up to date on all our latest videos. Uh, if you know somebody that you think would benefit from a Switch Adapted toy, uh, make sure you send this video to them. Uh, share our information and let them know that we're out there. Switch Adapted Toys is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and you can find out more about it on our website at www.switchtoys.org. Uh, there we've got kind of all our resources kind of in one place. We've got all our how-to videos, we've got written manuals that for toys that we don't have videos for, all of our 3D printed button files are on there, and all our resources are completely free. So go ahead and sign up to get access to all those resources, and again, 100% free. Our mission is just to get these toys and buttons into as many kids' hands as possible. And if you've got a group or an organization and you want to adapt toys kind of on a bigger scale for kids in your community, you could form what we call a Switch Chapter. Locally here in Columbia, where we're at, uh, we another nonprofit called Pascal's Pals donates about 100 to 200 toys every year, and we get community members together and we teach them how to adapt these toys. And so they help us adapt them, and then we give them away completely for free to, uh, at Christmas time uh, to families and kiddos with disabilities. We kind of have a shopping event where they can come and kind of pick one or two toys that just fit their needs of their child. Um, and it's just a great way to serve your community and the kiddos in your community. So if that's something that interests you, I encourage you to check out our website for more information. Lastly, if you're interested in a switch adapter toy or one of these switch buttons, uh, but doing it yourself just isn't your thing, uh, that's not a problem. We have got a Etsy shop where we sell some pre-adapted toys. All the toys and buttons that we have on our Etsy shop, we have free resources for. So if you want to do it yourself, uh, we, we encourage you to do it yourself. But if that's, again, if that's not your thing, we've got you covered. Um, you can go on there, pick up a switch adapter toy, a switch button. Uh, we have got kits, so we'll 3D print all the parts for your switch button if you want to assemble it yourself. It's a really good uh, way to, like a classroom project, um, something to kind of get a bunch of people involved in the process of switch adapting toys. Um, so if that interests you, check out our Etsy shop. Uh, we also have some merch on there, some t-shirts, some mugs, and all the proceeds help support what we're doing here. So thank you in advance for checking that out. Well, I guess that's it. I'm Eric with Switch Adapted Toys, and we'll see you next time. Switch Adapted Toys, making play possible.